As humans, we have, I, I think, as Jews, we'll start with, as humans, we have a problem. As Jews, we have two problems. The problem we have as humans uh, in pursuit of relationships that are harmonious, free of discord, uh, certainly free of divorce, uh, and apparently statistics show that we are miserable at it. Uh, and the problem is, is that, uh, you know, with the advancement in every area of science and technology and progress in every area of human development, somehow it seems like, in broad strokes, we are devolving with regards to relationships. Uh, I don't want to go the statistics. We all know the statistics. We all know people that are divorced, are getting divorced, people that are, have <coughs> choppy relationships. Someone just told me this week that in one of the neighborhoods in town, in U.S. neighborhoods, since they had a flood about a year ago, there were seven divorces, which to me was staggering. Uh, and uh, the question is, like, why are we so bad at it? Like, why? Like, we can figure out everything. We can make suspension bridges and Concorde planes and SpaceX uh, uh, rockets that are destined to go to Mars and supercomputers that fit into your pockets, but somehow we can't figure out how to have relationships that are sustaining, that are, you know, that, that are uh, at least at a minimum harmonious and positive. And the question is why? So I want to kind of approach it from that angle uh, as a kind of a human problem. But also as Jews, we are instructed some very bizarre instructions in the Torah uh, where <coughs> we are told as a commandment that we have to have love. In fact, <clears throat> there are three times in the Torah, three separate distinct mitzvahs, where we are commanded to have love or to love different entities. Uh, mitzvah number one, very famous verse. Of course, uh, it uh, was plagiarized by other religions. Uh, verse in Leviticus chapter 19, Lo sitom, velo sitar, don't have revenge, don't take revenge, don't avenge. Ve'ahavtu uh, rach Hashem, you should love your fellow as yourself, I am the Lord. Wherein we are commanded to love everyone, even the people that we're not so crazy about, and even the people that kind of are a little funny, even the people that are uh, foreigners, even the people that aren't as sharp or smell a little funny or whatever. We have to love everyone. Not only that, we're told as well in the book of Deuteronomy that you have to love converts. And that, of course, is problematic as well because converts are included in everybody. So if you have to love everybody, if white, you know, you certainly have to love converts as well. They're included. So what are we, what, you know, what, what's being added by being told to love converts? And uh, additionally intriguing is that we're told to love converts. Why? You have to love the convert. Because you yourself were foreigners. Love the foreigner because you were foreigners. In land of Egypt. Why are we told the reason why we have to love the foreigners, whereas everyone else, you got to love everyone, doesn't say love everyone because X, Y, or Z. It just says love everyone. And here we're told, love the converts uh, because you yourself were a foreigner as well. And lastly, the verse we read in last week's parasha, right, very famous verse, the second verse of the Shema, you have to love the Almighty. How much do you have to love the Almighty? With all your hearts, with all uh, your life, which means even if it means giving up your life, we know that uh, martyrdom is a central aspect of Jewish life, have to be ready to give up everything for God. And with all your resources, that's how much the intensity of love we have to have for God. Now, but the problem with these mitzvahs, these are mitzvahs, these aren't optional. It's not like, well, these are extra credit mitzvahs. These are mitzvahs that are obligatory in every Jew. 13-year-old becomes bar mitzvah, they are now obligated to love everyone. And the question is, like, if lo- love is an emotion, and it, thus an emotion, you either have it or you don't have it. You either love someone or you don't love someone. How could the Torah justifiably tell us, I command you to love each and every Jew? Right? And I command you to love a convert. I command you to love God. Well, what if God does bad things to you? What if you have tragedy? What if you have, you know, disaster in your life? You still have to love God? yes. Well, what if you're not feeling the love? And I think our society has understood that love as an emotion is something that you either have or you don't. You cannot kind of 
you can't uh, telegraph your way to love. You can't command it. You know, you, some people like, some people don't like. It's kind of, it, it's 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 like, uh, you know, some people like certain foods and other people don't like. Some people like fish and people don't like fish. I can't force you to like fish, right? You like it or you don't, right? I can't force you to love someone. You love them or you don't. Yet the Torah tells us that we're obligated to love everyone. And we're obligated to love the convert and obligated, obligated to love God. So I think that these two problems that we have as Jews uh, find a common solution. Um, what I want to present here tonight is an idea, at least the core of an idea, that demonstrates that the Torah believes that there is some sort of repeatable formula that you could follow, just follow steps, and love someone. And if we have that skill, if we, if we could, by the turn of a switch almost, we could guarantee that we love someone, well, the people that we want to dedicate or partner with on our lives, you know, people we want to share our lives with, the people that it's most crucial that the love that we have for them does not dissipate, wouldn't that be a great skill to have, to know just how to say, okay, I'll just follow these instructions, and I'll love them, and then I won't have the misery of falling out of love, and, and I'll be able to have a wonderful life. That's the idea. That's the, that's the, the general premise. We'll see if we can do this. So, that the premise is that from the fact that the Torah tells us that we are commanded to have an emotion, it must be that it's possible to do it. If it wasn't possible, then it wouldn't be fair for the Almighty. The Almighty could say, hey, listen, <clears throat> eat matzah. What's matzah? Make matzah. These flat uh, crackers and how you make them and how you eat them and you, you follow the instructions. P- put a mezuzah. Well, what's a mezuzah, right? Where it's filling, right? Observe the Shabbos. These things are, uh, you know, the, there is a formula. What you do, you follow, follow to get it. The Torah tells us, love this person, love that person, love God. It's obvious that the Torah understands that there is some sort of repeatable formula that you could, you could observe, you just follow it, and you'll arrive at your destination. And I think that is a, a tremendous, just the idea is an insight. Uh, and if we could actually get that still, I think it would radically alter our relationships. Uh, and, of course, you know, it's a, it's a mitzvah. And wouldn't that be nice to be able to fulfill this mitzvah uh, perfectly as well. But not only that, <coughs> as a little bit of trivia, the Talmud tells us that Rabbi Akiva, the great uh, legend and hero of the, Mish- of the Mishnah, he was famous, famously said, to love your fellow as yourself is a general principle of Torah. Almost as if all of Torah can be distilled down to this one mitzvah which really demonstrates that this one mitzvah and its still of achieving it really is a gateway to everything that the Almighty wants from us. It's almost as if, if, if you could figure out how to love your fellow as yourself, you'll know how to do all 613 mitzvahs, all of Torah, and the Almighty will be proud of you. And what's more wonderful than that? Okay, so... So, so that's the idea. There's, there's a formula, there's a learnable skill that we could follow to get love. Now the question is, where exactly do we go to find out what that formula is? You know, it's, like, it's like this um, God particle. You guys saw the story about this. this uh, the, phys- the physicists are obsessed with this Higgs boson thing. This some sort of particle that like unlocks everything. It's this matter, antimatter. Somehow if you could access it, but everyone's trying to find it. They found it, they didn't find it You've see, all seen that stories. I feel like this still is kind of like the God still. It's the God particle. Maybe not, maybe not, not a great term, but because it's so valuable. It's like, it's like alchemy, right? If, if you knew how to do alchemy, if you knew how to turn lead into gold, wouldn't that be the most valuable still in the world? Because once you have turned lead into gold, then you could do whatever you want, right? I feel like this still is kind of the same way. Like if you could figure out how to command or how to follow a formula and get, get the love, well, according to Rekiv, you have all of Torah, but not only that, like, your relationships will be demystified for you. It's such a, it's a it, you know, it's, it's clear that 
humanity is so bad at this whole arena of our lives. It's, we, we all know people. Everyone here knows people that have relationships that have gone sour. And the question is why these people are so put together in every other area in their lives. The successful businessmen, professionals, uh, uh, physicians and lawyers, they, they have everything figured out, but somehow they cannot get along with their spouse. And it's just they're screaming at each other all the time, the kids suffer. It's a disaster. It's a very valuable skill. Where would we go to try to find uh, this formula? So, I want to... Uh, I want to preface here. I want to preface this. uh, Just one more quick introduction. You have to love your fellow as yourself. What does that mean, as yourself? What does that mean? So let's say if I love myself, 98 units of love, however you want to measure it. Kilojoules of love. Right? I got to love my fellow and everyone that same amount of love. Is that right? Is that what it means? Boris is dubious. That seems un- is that, is that, Does that seem reasonable? To love, you know, I've been, we, we've all been self loving since the day we were born. But now you so think you're self loving. <coughs> you might not be self loving. Well, so that's an interesting point. If you don't love yourself, it's clearly not included in this if mitzvah. You, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. I would agree to that. That's a, f- a fascinating observation, so, that this mitzvah is only told to people who already love themselves. If you're not healthy... Is there a mitzvah to love yourself? No, I haven't seen that mitzvah. I would say maybe if you don't love yourself, then it's, I would say it's kind of a... It precedes right, Torah. Mm, so, maybe. Well, it's not so clear what that mitzvah means. Well, loving you yourself know. can go on a bunch of levels. Like if you don't get enough sleep, if you don't eat yeah. right, if you don't work out, if you just feel crappy and... In turn, you make everybody else around you crappy. Well, I, I think clearly um, uh, a baseline for any de- growth and development in Torah, in you know self development, has to be predicated upon you know good health and all kinds of health. You know, you have to be if you're not mentally healthy. I had a, a student of mine. Well, I'm not going to say this. Okay, I'll skip that because there is a non-zero chance that uh, they may listen to this. That I love a lot. Okay. Moving right along. So, you have to love your fellow as yourself. What if you don't know how to love yourself? Uh How do you love the other guy? The problem, okay, fine. That's also a good question. You're asking more questions. Let's try try to analyze what it says, right? We know, Rabbi Johnny can attest, that the Talmud tells us that if, if, if there's one bottle of water and you can only save you or your friend, the halacha is you have to save yourself. Really? Yes. There was one bottle of water. Two, two, you, and, you and your friend are in the <coughs> desert. There's one bottle of water. You've got to save yourself. You Why? Know. Huh? You no, know. even if they're a Jew. You, you have to. Because your life takes precedence over, supersedes their life. So wait a minute. Uh, am I supposed to love them as much as myself? Apparently not. So I want to just... Uh, just I think it's, it makes it easier, it makes it harder. What it means to love your fellow as yourself is not the quantity of love, how much love. Rather, it's the quality of love. It's the, uh, it's, it's, it's the uh, nature of the love. How so? I want to fulfill what the Torah says. The Torah says, love my fellow as myself. I can't stand the guy. I can't stand him. Nothing about them. There's no virtue that I admire. But I want to fulfill what the Torah wants of me. So I'll love them. And I'll say, I am fulfilling the Almighty's will by loving them. I can't stand them, but I'll love them anyhow. Wait a minute. Do you love yourself because it's a mitzvah to do it? No one, healthy people. Healthy people don't love themselves because someone commanded them in fourth grade, you know, <clears throat> they learned the mitzvah of loving yourself. No. They always love themselves. So that's what healthy people do. Love your fellow as yourself means don't love them because of some sort of mitzvah. Find a way to actually achieve that emotion of love towards them. Right? It's the same kind of love. Well, that I think augments our problem, or at least clarifies our problem. We have to find a way, a formula to achieve an emotion. 
a genuine emotion, love your fellow as yourself the same way you love yourself, love them, not because of some sort of rigid ritual that I'm going to act with them towards love because that's a mitzvah. No. As yourself, you don't love yourself like that, don't love your fellow like that. Love him the way you love yourself. Go ahead. Isn't like brotherly love a little different than romantic love? Clear. Okay. So, so, but the Torah uses the same word. The Torah uses the same word for uh, uh, for all kinds of love. Love God also. Well, well, that's a different kind of obviously. So clearly, the, the, from the fact that Torah is pooling them together, there's some core that they share. And the question is, what that is. So what I decided to do here is um, try to find the first time in the Torah that it said that somebody loved someone else. And kind of see, try to analyze that section of the Torah and see what we could glean from it. So I found in the book of Genesis, there's a description of a budding relationship between Isaac and Rebecca. Remember the story? Uh, Isaac is of marriageable age. His father Abraham sends an emissary. We know him as Eliezer. He sends into his family out east to uh, Mesopotamia. He travels east with a bunch of camels and he meets the girl who is Rebecca. And he says, oh, well, you know, you're the right girl for me, but first let's do a test. And he asks her, well, give me something to drink. And she gives him to drink. Gives the camel to drink. Very long story, very long narrative. Finally, everything works out. He takes her back to Israel, and they, uh, meet, she meets Isaac, and they get married. And the quote of uh, the verse that describes their marriage is as follows. And Isaac brought her, brought Rebecca to the tent of Sarah, his mother, and he married Rebekah, and she was to him for a wife. And he loved her, and he was consoled after his mom. There's a lot of moving parts here in this verse, right? But what will jump out at us if we analyze this is that in the description of the nascent marriage of Isaac and Rebekah, we meet Sarah the ever-intrusive mother-in-law, twice. Sarah recently passed away. And Isaac brings Rebecca to the tent of Sarah, his mother. That's number one. And he marries Rebecca, and she's to him a wife, and he loves her. And he's consoled after his mother. And, I, and Isaac is consoled after Sarah, his mother. Why are we invoking Sarah multiple times in the description of a marriage of Isaac and Rebecca, like it's the ever-intrusive mother-in-law, right? Why, why is she such a big part of this story? So Rashi tells us, Rashi says like this, Sarah was a tremendously righteous woman, and the, she had some miracles that happened in her tent because of her. What were these miracles? Number one, when she lit candles on Friday night, those candles lasted until the following Friday night. Number one. Number two, when she would make challah for Shabbat, she would make a little bit of dough and she built to make 150 loaves. There was a blessing in the dough. The dough just proliferated. And lastly, there was an ever-present cloud hovering over her tent. The cloud which represents the Shekhinah. Those miracles were there when Sarah was alive. Sarah died. She's gone. And with her, are the miracles. A couple years later, Isaac gets married. And he brings Rebecca to the tent of Sarah, his mother. And he marries her. And she's him for his wife. And he loves her. And he's consoled after his mother. So what actually happened over here is that Isaac brought her to the tent of Sarah to see what happens when Rebecca walks into the same tent. And lo and behold, she walks into the tent... And you know what comes back? All the miracles. The candles last from week to week. The dough has blessing in it. The cloud is just there. And he's so excited. He marries her. He loves her. And he, he's consoled after his mom. There's now a spiritual replacement. Someone in the same category as his mom is now come back, came back to his life. And what's interesting is, the Torah throws in the word that, what happened? First, he kind of vetted her. First he said, who is this person? What is 
their makeup, of, of their character. And he said, wow, look at, this, look at this person. Look at Rebecca. She's so righteous. She's such a wonderful person. She has such character. And he loved her. I want to just bring this a little full circle. I spent a couple of years in the yeshiva in Israel. A yeshiva called Eshet Torah. Perhaps you've heard of it. Eshet Torah was founded by Rabbi Noah Weinberg. Rabbi Noah Weinberg had a saying that he would always say again and again. He says, when you come to yeshiva, you learn what the definition of love is. What's the definition of love? Love is the pleasure you get by recognizing the virtue in another person and identifying them with those virtues. He would say this again and again, ten times a day. And I was always perplexed. Like, where does, where does such a definition of love come from? You could ask a million people for definition of definition of love. No, no, none of the people will give you that. And where is that? That's, like, that's a Torah's definition of love. That's what you get from Yeshiva. And it turns out that this verse says it plainly. Isaac recognized the virtue in Rebecca. He identified her with those virtues. And a product of that means that he loved her. And this, I think, is groundbreaking because this really opens the door for a repeatable formula to love. Love is when you recognize good in someone else. You see their good character, their good behavior, their nice midos, as we say. They're kind, they're generous, they're intelligent, you know, they're sincere, they're pa- whatever it is, they're patient. You recognize that and you label them, you identify them with those virtues. Automatically, you'll love them. Okay, now here's the clincher. We are all a mixed bag. Every one of us in this room has some character that's admirable. It's really nice. It's really wonderful. You know, we are told to learn. Have a call them. Who is the wise person? He who learns from every person. Do you know why? Because everyone has something to teach. We're all a mixed bag. Some of us have, you know, characters... Uh, traits in one area that we are, that were more refined and other years less, but we all have something admirable about us. Conversely, we all have something that's a little bit uh, shameful about us that we need to work on. So I could love every person in the room, and that doesn't depend upon them, it depends upon me. If I choose to seek out their virtues, to say, this person, what is wonderful about them that I can learn? Well, then a product of that, I, I will love them. I could also hate every person in the room because I could, I could conversely say, what are the negative characters about this person that would make me not want to like them? And you know what? Either way, you cho- either door you choose, you'll, have, you'll find something because we're all a mixed bag. There's only a few people in the world that are on the extremes, that have everything good or everything bad. But hey, most of the people are somewhere in the middle. We're kind of average, Right? So the choice that I have is will I love someone or will I hate them depending upon what will I look for when I'm trying to classify them, when I'm trying to label them, or trying to identify them. I'll love them if I seek out their good, their qualities, and identify with them with those qualities. No, just a caveat. That doesn't mean that I ignore their, you know, their, their part of their character profile that's less admirable. Maybe you're aware of that. But you put it in perspective. Who are they? They're good. Why? Because I'm identifying them with their five or six or ten qualities. We all know people that are very skilled at criticism of other people. Any person they meet, they could say, hmm, I could kind of laser them, Xerox them, kind of trying to find exactly what it is about them that's not admirable. And by the way, those people don't have a lot of friends because everyone they know is just a horrible monster. On the other hand, people that have tons of friends are the ones that are always looking for the positive. And you know what? They always find the positive because there always is positive. Thus, when the Torah tells us, love your fellow as yourself, where is that mitzvah situated? That's not situated on other people. It's on you. It's change your lenses. That's what it's telling you. Change the way you look and relate 
to other people. Change your mindset. Your mindset may have been previously to always notice the bad and always kind of ignore the good. Flip that on its head and you love everyone. Thus, it's a repeatable formula. Simple. You want to love someone? What do you got to do? Seek out their good and identify them with the good. And the problem with this is, the reason why it's hard is because we are wired the exact opposite. When someone does something bad, it jumps out at us. In fact, we have even sources, like going ancient sources in Jewish literature talk about this, how it's kind of flipped on its head. When someone does something bad, we notice it immediately, and right away we identify them with that characteristic. Conversely, when someone does something good, we don't automatically uh, link that to their character profile. We say, oh, that someone did something nice. That's like an isolated act. But something bad, that's who they are. Right? We flip that on its head. We change our lenses. We love everyone. Thus, the Torah can legitimately say, you have to love everyone because it's possible. Because everyone has something that's admirable. Everyone has something that they could teach you about. Well, if someone who's greater than you in some area, well... Wouldn't you love them? Wouldn't you appreciate their qualities? I want to kind of broaden this idea. I feel like maybe maybe we should just stop here because this is something to think about. I don't know, you know, this is something really valuable. You know, you talk about marriages, right? So. Why do people get married? Because they like each other and they think it's a good idea to get married, right? I assume that's the reason why most people get married, right? I don't know. I, I, I only got married once. <laughs> I don't know. But that's what I assume, right? Okay, so then what happens? They decide they want to marry someone and then they say, uh, five, six, seven, eight years later, no, I'm, I'm opting out. I'm not resigning. Um, why does that happen? Well, I think perhaps we now know. Because if you are accustomed to noticing the bad in someone's character and identifying them with their, char- with their negative character, that will apply to your spouse as well. And all the more so, because you're involved with them in your day-to-day lives more than any other person. So you're more likely to encounter something bad about their character. You know, why don't you put away your clothing? You know, or why do you do this? Or why do you do this with a toothbrush? Or why, you know, why do you take out the garbage? Or, you know, there's so many areas in life of the people that we live in the most proximity to to notice their negative. And if we, are, we don't change our perspective in general, in aggregate, we're more likely to hate our spouses, which is mind-boggling. But, conversely, we flip the switch we make this mental change and start noticing the good in someone and kind of not, you notice the bad, okay, but not dwelling upon it, our love for the people that we're most close to will deepen. Why? Because those people also have, we're in close proximity to those people as well, and therefore we're going bound to notice more of their goodness. It's a great story I have. It's, it's so unbelievable, the story, even though it's like not, you know, it's, it wouldn't, it's not like sci-fi. You know, it's not that kind of unbelievable. Rabbi Chaim Leib Shmuel Levitz was a famous a Lithuanian slash Israeli rabbi. And he was the head of the vaunted Amir Yeshiva in Israel. Amir Yeshiva is a famous yeshiva. In fact, it just the past year celebrated its bicentennial. It's been around for 200 years. Really? Yes. It has 8,000 students. Enormous yeshiva. It's here. Oh, yeah. 1815. It was founded in Mir, Poland. 8,000 now? 8,000 8, now, yeah. So, he once commented that he can delineate thousands of qualities about his spouse. Huh? He can uh, number, he can list, he can, yeah, he can think of, he can make a list of thousands of qualities. Now, to me, like, the reason why this is such an amazing story, like, I can't even think of, like, 
10 or 12 or 15 different qualities. Well, patient, happy, joyous. I, I don't know. Like, it's hard for us to, we're not used to thinking in those terms. But if you train yourself to always look for the positive of other people, you're always looking for the positive. And thus you'll notice things that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And think about that. Who wouldn't love someone that they know thousands of good things about them? Of course you would. Everyone would. But we all have good things about us. And everyone that we encounter also has good things about them. The only question is, will we do it? And will we resist the default perspective of labeling with a negative and noticing much more viscerally the negative as well? Now, what does Rabbi Kiva say? Loving your fellow as yourself is a major principle of Torah. If you have this, you have everything. Perhaps we can say like this. Why am I going to notice the bad in someone and not so much the good? And personally, I'll notice all the good that I do and the, the bad are kind of, you know, the bad is, uh, that's an aberration. Well, we we'll got the God in a second. But we all love ourselves. Remember, the way we define love is how we identify someone and how, and how we kind of uh, evaluate their behavior. For ourselves, we're very quick to justify when we make mistakes. You behaved terribly. I was tired. I had such a bad day at work. Right? We, we always are ready, and maybe justifiably. I'm not, we're not saying it's, you know, but the point is, is that's the way we work. Our good deeds, well, that's who we are. Our bad deeds, those are aberrations. Conversely, we meet someone else, it's the exact opposite. Their good deeds maybe are aberrations, and their bad deeds, well, that's who they are. So there is incongruity here between the way we view others and the way we view ourselves. We create this little world for ourselves where we live and we don't give other people the same treatment. We're told love your fellow as yourself, which means to change who you are. What's Torah? What's the goal of Torah? Can we say perhaps that the fundamental goal of Torah is to change the framework of our humanity, so to speak, of our identity. We're told, do mitzvahs. Love God. We'll get to God in a second. All the mitzvahs that God tells us. Be involved with God, be involved with the community, be involved with other people. What is that really doing to us? Perhaps we can say that we, from the beginning of our lives, we're in this little cocoon, this little shelter, this little windowless room we're in all we have is ourselves. We're very selfish. A little child, all they care about in their lives is themselves. All they, the most selfish beings ever created. Middle of the night, they're hungry. What do they do? They'll stream and stream and stream until they get what they need. Uh, what if your mom didn't sleep? Or what if there's other kids that, you know, what if you just got fat? Like, it doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. Well, if if you're living with yourself, if that's all that exists, well then of course you'll love others, you'll love yourself, and other people, they're foreigners, they're outsiders. Perhaps the goal of Torah and mitzvahs is to crack a little window inside this worldview that we have. If you're in a windowless room, you have nothing besides for yourself. You crack open a window, you see everything. You see the people, you see the skies, you see the trees, you see the flowers. If we're living with ourselves, if all we have is ourselves, if all we love is ourselves, well, then it's just us. The Torah is telling us, crack yourself open. And you know what? By doing that, there's room for other people, and there's room for God. If you're selfish, how could you have God in your life? If you're selfish, how could you have other people in your lives, in your life? You can't. 
Thus, the idea of love, of changing the way we view other people, that demands that we change ourselves. We change ourselves and we have everything. We should have a relationship with God, relationship with other people. We have it all. We're told in Genesis, beginning of Genesis, Adam and Eve, uh, Adam says, Adam's so excited when he finally gets a spouse. He says, this time it's the best. This is flesh for my flesh. This is bone for my bone. I'm going to call her Isha. She's going to be called a woman because it's going to be Isha Lukacha. And then there's a verse like this. Al Cain, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, cleave to his wife, and become one flesh. Very interesting verse. I think what this is actually telling us, that in order to be successful in the most intimate relationship of your life, you have to leave something. You have to leave your father and mother. You have to leave the petty attitude where only you exist and you only love yourself. You have to leave that. Because if you want to create a new identity, a unified identity, you're going to have to break the pre-existing identity. It's not easy to develop a deep, emotional, real, lasting and a harmonious bond with another person. It's not. Do you know why? Because by doing that, to create a new identity, you have to discard the previous identity. Well, what does it mean to discard the previous, previous identity? The identity of all you love is yourself, all you see is yourself, right? You've got to crack that open. You've got to open up your world for other people. You have to love other people. Well, how do you do that? You have to change who you are. But once you do that, there's room for God in your life, there's room for other people in your life as well. Just to follow through here, some more examples. What about the convert? So we're told you've got to love the convert. Well, yeah, your convert's very included in everyone else, right? Of course you have to love the convert. Not only that, we're told you've got to love the convert because you yourself were a foreigner in the land of Egypt. What does that have to do with anything? You have someone who converts, right? Conver- someone converts to the religion. Great. Welcome aboard. I have to love them. Why? Because 3,312 years ago, whatever it was, we, oh, 28 years ago, I think it was, 3,000 years ago, a long time ago, we uh, were slaves in Egypt. How do those two thoughts connect? It's not so clear, right? Perhaps what this is telling us is like this. How do you love someone? How do you change? How do you create the same relationship that you have internally with yourself to other people? You have to find common ground. Love the foreigner because you were a foreigner. How do you allow people into your world? How do you find commonality, common ground with, with someone else? you find overlapping experiences. We all know the feeling of being the odd man out, of being the new boy on the block, of being the first day in school, you don't really know your way around. You know the feeling of loneliness and isolation? Well, what happens when you have a foreigner? Someone who comes to join the religion, they don't know the way around, they don't know where to go and what to do and what the right things to do. If I can identify with someone else, I can love them. How do you identify with someone else? You've got to break your, break your mold. By doing that, you start appreciating, you can't appreciate what someone else is going through. You know, perhaps this is another reason why. Love your fellow as yourself. You should know that you and him are really not so different. All of us are really not so different. We all, we all have struggles and we all have challenges and we all have areas of life that we wish we could improve on. We all have successes that we're proud of, but ambitions and goals, aspirations, things we yearn that we could have, we're all kind of similar. Love your fellow as yourself. This guy's going through something difficult. How do you empathize with that? Well, you also went through something, through something difficult yourself as well. Thus, the Torah is telling us much more about, much more about a, a separate, isolated mitzvah, love the convert. Of course, the convert was included in the original mitzvah. But this is telling us, once again, how to do it. How do you love? If you can find commonality, you'll empathize with them. 
And lastly, there's a message to love God. This one's a little hard for us, right? We have a hard time even conceptualizing what that even means. What does God even mean? It's a very hard thing to define. It's not such an easy thing to work with, right? We have a hard time defining God, yet we're told to love God. How does that work? How can we love the entity that's beyond our comprehension? Okay, so let's try to use the same formula. You will love someone that you appreciate their goodness. Is there any kind of goodness that we can appreciate that God does for us? We're told, Talmud tells us, that we have to do 100 blessings a day. Every day, 100 blessings. Every year, 36,000 blessings. Every lifetime, I don't know, I don't have a calculator. Lots and lots and lots of blessings. Well, 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 well. The Almighty needs our blessings? Certainly not. Certainly not. To love God, that's not for God's sake, that's for our sake. It's to make our life more enriched. And it's exactly the same process. If you love your fellow, you'll end up loving God as well. If you love God, you'll end up loving your fellow. Because both of them demand you change yourself. You change yourself and everything will fall into place by default. Well, how do you love God? Or better yet, why would you not already love God? None of us died in the past four minutes, right? Why not? How many things could have gone wrong in the past four minutes that would have rendered us dead beyond repair? How many pipes do we have in our body? We have a labyrinthine network of pipes that is vastly more complex than all of the roads on this planet. Can you imagine a system where there's not a single accident that clogs up a single highway in Houston, much less America and the world, for a day? You can't imagine that, right? Mistakes always happen. But a mistake happens to us, we're dead. We're dead. Why don't we ever notice that? Whoa, that's just beginning, right? Has anyone here drunk a coffee this morning? Or three? (laughs) You drink coffee, why are you not dead? It's it's toxins. How are you not dead? Because you have a liver. And scientists have isolated more than 500 individual functions of of a liver. What do we do to deserve it? Nothing. A blessing is a way to learn to love. Because it's a way of getting out of our little solitary confinement that we started off life with. We start off life as all we have is ourselves. God doesn't exist in our world. Well, of course God doesn't exist in the world. We don't appreciate Him. Of course. What's a blessing? A blessing is where you're taking your little chisel, and you're taking, making a little hole in your prison cell. That's what it is. A blessing is you're thinking, wait a minute, wow, what? God exists and he's giving me food and there's water and there's the sun. We're right in the Goldilocks zone. We're exactly 93 million miles away. Not too close, not too far. Perfect for human habitation. There's so many millions of things that are exactly right because the Almighty loves us and wants us alive. But we take it all for granted. Why? Because we're in a little world. In a little world, if, if you're in your own box, God doesn't exist, your fellow man doesn't exist, your parents don't exist, your, you won't have good relationships. Nothing. Nothing, will, nothing else exists. It's just you. To be fair, go ahead. You can't appreciate breathing unless someone's trying to stop you from doing it. That's right. But, but what's the function of a blessing? The function of a blessing is to simulate that scarcity. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. We don't have scarcity. But we make a blessing every time you go to the bathroom. There's a best, you know the blessing you say when you go to the bathroom, I share it, sir? What's the, what's the words of those blessings? Right? We're talking about the fact that we have a digestive system which is marvelous beyond description. And all the pipes, everything works, all the pi- internal piping works. 
well, but if the pipes never stop working, why would you appreciate it? The answer is you have to simulate that scarcity. You simulate the scarcity, and then you recognize what you actually have. Problem is, what's the problem? Problem is that we don't appreciate what we have until we don't have it. Well, then what do we gain? We lose out a lot. But if you imagine life without something, then you can appreciate it once more, just as the most general rule. If you think about the fact that you're going to be dead within 100 years, well, most of I would say all of us probably are going to be dead, right? Right? That's a fair assessment. 110, just to round up the rounding errors. <laughs> right? That, sh- that thought should absolutely terrify us. It should terrify us. We're going to be put in the ground and we'll start decomposing within 45 minutes. You're not going to know. You're dead. Uh, well, we, don't, what do you, well, we don't know what you're going to know, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah Okay, but either way, that thought makes our life more meaningful, I think. If life, if we didn't realize the fact that we, there will come a time where we don't have the opportunity of life, that thought makes our life more meaningful. We're simulating scarcity, right? We're simulating not having that. That's what a blessing is. I think people do that now, though. Like, I know I'm not going to be 110. That's why people get married and have kids in their 20s, because you know you're not going to live to be 500. If I knew I was going to live to be 500, I might wait a few hundred years. <laughs> but right. I know I'm not. But, the, but, that's, but that's a very positive experience to recognize the fact that you're not going to live forever. It's a very powerful experience. By the way, you look at Rosh Hashanah, we have the high holidays coming up. High holidays, this is a theme that we invoke multiple times on the high holidays. Why? Because it makes our life more meaningful. And the time where we need to appreciate life and to value our life more than any other time, it's a time where we have to pull all the stops, right? You've got to pull all the tricks out of your bag. Out of your bag. A blessing, when you take a glass of water and you say, the Almighty gave me this, and if I didn't have this, I'd be, I'd be parched. Right? You're simulating scarcity, right? And you make, you make yourself appreciate it. You're, you're, you're making a little hole in your little cage that, you, that we all live in. And you know what? If we're still in the cage, we cannot have positive relationships. It's not, it's not possible. It's not possible. We can still file taxes jointly. That's still possible. That's possible, right? You can still, you know, uh, father children together or parent children together. That's possible. But does that really mean that you broke out of this jail and created a new identity? No. No. And the only way to have positive relationships is if you do that. It's not, listen, but, but there's a formula. Follow the formula, and it's, is it easy? No, of course, because you have to go against that that is pre-programmed. You know, we'll pre program like that. But the Torah helps us, by the way. Y- y- people say, uh, uh, all these mitzvahs, all blessings, for an example, or prayer, or um, you know, any, anything that's related to God. How is that going to help me in my life? Which, even if we're not thinking about kind of our spiritual realm and our spiritual iteration, forget about that for a second. Any time I open up my life for God, my life is a little bit more open as well for other people. Because the, 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 the relationship's the same. You love God, you love your fellow, right? How do you achieve them the same way? You've got to open up yourself. So what we don't realize is that making a blessing over food and recognizing everything that had to happen, not, taking, and not being entitled and noticing the good that's been done to you, that may seem to be a spiritualistic perspective or activity, but really it's going to help us in the entirety of our lives. Every area of our lives will, will be changed because we are slowly breaking out of this little shell that is uh, causing us so much uh, so much uh, uh, prob- so many problems uh, in our lives. So, in conclusion, the Torah tells us that we have to love everyone. Clearly, the Torah believes that we can do it. Uh, but not only that, the Torah also tells us how to do it. How do you do it? You've got to notice them. Maybe that's a good place to start, to notice other people, just to notice that they exist. There are other people occupying this planet. Wow, and they also have like 
uh, you know, disappointments and difficulties in relationships and difficulties at work and difficulties in their professional life and their personal life. You know, they're also struggling to maintain their, their diet or to maintain their resolution or to work out, like you said, or to sleep properly, or maybe someone woke them up in the middle of the night. Just, just open up your eyes. The fact that all the troubles that we live with ourselves, so to speak, other people have them as well. Wow, isn't that a novel idea? How come we don't think about that? Because we, we're still little babies, you know? You do that, just notice other people. Like That's maybe the first step. You notice other people and you know, you're on your way to greatness. Uh, and at the end of the line, Moses, by the way, if you look at every, almost every story about Moses, certainly the first story, the last story, middle story is told by Moses, he excelled in this characteristic. This is what he was. And that's why it's not a shock to the fact that he was the leader of a nation of millions on one hand and had the most intimate relationship of any prophet with God. How is it possible that someone was so successful in such divergent arenas? He's able to converse with God and is able to lead a nation of millions? Those, those two don't seem to overlap, right? They seem to be different skills. Abraham. Ab- Who is Abraham? What's he famous for? He invented monotheism. He should be presented in the Torah as the paragon of faith. Somehow, if you open the Torah, you wouldn't mention any faith. All we see is kindness. Kindness with the three angels, kindness with Lo, kindness with the, the, the wicked people of Sodom and Gomorrah, kindness everywhere you, everywhere you turn. Chesed Lavraham. How is it possible? So I went to excel in such divergent ears. The answer is it's, it's really the same. You change yourself. You change yourself, it changes everything. It changes the relationship between God between you and God, and between you and everyone else. And I wish you all a lot of success in your relationships, relationship with other people, with uh, your spouses, if you have spouses, with uh, your spouses, if you don't yet have spouses, and uh, with your parents and your siblings, and certainly your coworkers and colleagues and all the people that you encounter in your life, but also with the Almighty. You know, which is... you know, it's it simplified, right? Change yourself and everything else will follow suit. I thank you all. Thank you and uh, all the best. Yes.